Thank you very much for this uh, opportunity to speak. I, I'm just going to put this out there. Um, I forgot to pack a tie last night. But it's just a tie, and I think you and I both know it could have been a lot worse. When, well, I don't need to borrow yours. I'm okay. Thank you. When we talk about the cost of cancer care, we most often talk in tens and hundreds of billions of dollars. These numbers are really hard to, to wrap my arms around, at least. And what I'd like to talk about today is how do these almost incomprehensible numbers trickle down to the level of patients that I see in clinic every day. And specifically, I'd like to talk about one patient. This is Chris. Chris is my patient. Um, at the age of 38, he was diagnosed with localized rectal cancer. He was employed and was fully insured. At the time that I diagnosed him, I started him on a fairly standard treatment regimen with chemotherapy and radiation. And the chemotherapy uh, was a pill called capecitabine. Uh, he did very well. He really had no physical toxicities associated with his treatment. But unfortunately, after about two months of treatment, we found that his cancer had spread to his liver. So I started talking to him about chemotherapy options going forward. And the regimen that I proposed to him included capecitabine. As I'm talking to him, he said, stop for a second, doc. I don't think I can do this. And I was a little bit taken aback. He's young. He did very well with the regimen. I asked him a little bit more, and I realized Chris didn't have any prescription drug coverage. So because of the treatment that I prescribed him, he had incurred thousands of dollars of bills uh, just over the course of a few weeks. Chris didn't realize that he had options. If I had known about that, uh, I could have switched him to an IV formulation of that drug. Because it's an infusion, it wouldn't have cost him anything. I could have referred him to the pharmaceutical industry's um, uh, access program. I could have referred him to our own access program at Duke. But I didn't, um, and that was my fault. If I had just asked him one simple question, do you have prescription drug coverage, I could have saved him thousands of dollars uh, in financial burden and the financial toxicity associated with that. So what I'd like to talk about today is patients like Chris. Why were his costs so high? How did it impact his well-being? How did it impact the quality of his care? And what can we do to make sure that patients like Chris don't suffer this level of financial toxicity again? So first, let's talk about how, uh, how and why out-of-pocket costs are increasing. If you look at um, national health uh, expenditure projections for annual out-of-pocket costs for all patients, we see an upward trend from about $325 a year today to you know, $450-ish um, in 2022. That's not a lot. Right? I think most people would agree a few hundred dollars a year uh, for out-of-pocket uh, costs for health care is really not that much. But what these data don't reflect is how much cancer patients pay. And that's a lot more. There are studies that suggest that cancer patients pay anywhere between four dollars to $5,000 a year out of pocket um, for their health care. What, what are they spending on? So about a third of their treatment is spent on prescription drugs, another third on other ambulatory care, so physician's fees, outpatient's procedures, <coughs> excuse me, and then the remainder on inpatient care and other costs. So really, over two-thirds of uh, the total out-of-pocket costs are because of things that I do. So prescriptions that I write, procedures that I order, and so on. And part of the reason that um, these costs are so high is because of the rising cost of drugs. Peter, I'm showing your data again, so maybe you get a bonus? Get to fly back, coach, and not, well, yeah. <laughs> Um, so, so Peter uh, referred to these data uh, uh, at, at, uh, earlier this morning. And basically, um, each dot represents four weeks of um, chemotherapy. From the 1970s to the 1990s, about a month of chemotherapy costs anywhere from a few hundred to maybe a couple of thousand bucks. After that, we see a skyrocketing in price of these drugs, where even the drugs that I use in clinic cost anywhere from fifteen dollars to twenty dollars to $30,000 a month. So why is that? Well, um, a lot of people would argue that innovation has a role to play. 
A lot of the drugs that we're seeing on market, come on market are not the traditional cytotoxic agents, but rather the biologic agents. And we know that those biologic agents um, cost more, and some would argue cost more to uh, develop and market, uh, and, and market produce. So in 2003, biologics comprised about 10% of the oncology market. As of last year, they comprise almost half of the oncology market. In addition, a lot of the new drugs that are coming on market are oral drugs as opposed um, to IV. And so those drugs are covered for the most part under um, the uh, prescription benefit rather than uh, the medical benefit. Another trend that we're seeing in the cost of these drugs is that even after oral oncolytics enter the market, their price increases. So here's data per pill from 2007 to 2014. For example, Tarceva per pill cost initially $100 uh, and has now increased to around $200 with a 91% increase. And that's all I have today. Thank you. There we go. Um, so Sprycell increased by 130%, and Gleevec, which has been in the news a lot recently, increased uh, by, uh, in price by 158% between 2007 to 2014. So patients are paying more uh, for the drugs today than they were seven years ago. So out-of-pocket costs are increasing. In addition, cost sharing is increasing as well. So patients are experiencing um, a higher level of financial burden uh, for any given uh, treatment. I'm having some trouble with this pointer. I'm not sure if it's a battery issue. Um, so I, I think one of the prime examples of how cost sharing is increasing is just by looking at the cost of insurance itself. So this is data from 1999 to 2013. And on the y-axis, you see percent change. So inflation is there as a baseline. Worker earnings have kept up with inflation, but you see premiums have gone up by 182%, and worker contribution to premiums have gone up by nearly 200%. So insurance itself has become more expensive, and the amount that patients pay before their ins insurance takes over has also increased because deductibles have increased as well. So from 2006 to 2013, the um, deductible, average deductibles that patients are paying uh, have uh, nearly doubled. And of course, I think one of the most common um, forms of increased cost sharing that we're all familiar with is tiered formularies. It's a good thing I'm not telling any jokes because my timing would be way off. Um, for the uh, proportion of uh, tiered, um, uh, multi-tiered, so four and five tiered formularies that we're seeing, um, you know, the proportion of patients Oh, I just can't point it anywhere. I can't like point it, <laughs> point it this way, sorry. Um, so the proportion of patients who are on four and five tiered formularies have increased from zero in 2003 to nearly one out of four patients uh, last year. And that number has um, almost doubled just in the past couple of years. And of course, this is important for our patients uh, in cancer care because uh, majority of the oral uh, oncolytics that we prescribe fall into the higher fourth and fifth specialty tiers. So what's going to happen with the Affordable Care Act? Short answer is, I'm not sure anybody really knows, but let's um, set up a scenario with a family of four. Um, the majority of enrollees are signing up for silver plans. So we'll look at it, that's about 65% um, or higher to date have signed up for silver plans. So we'll look at a typical family of four signing up for uh, a silver plan. Um, for a family with an income of 200% of the federal poverty limit, and that's approximately uh, $47,000, so median income in the U.S. is near that, they would pay approximately $10,000 out of pocket before their caps set in. So I already showed you, today, cancer patients are paying somewhere between four dollars to $5,000 out of pocket. Maybe subsidies will have an effect here, but I think my point is, is that I'm not really certain that out-of-pocket costs for cancer care will necessarily decrease um, uh, with, the, with the Affordable Care Act. And as a result, patients are having difficulty paying their medical bills. So this data from uh, Kaiser shows that one out of three patients 
surveyed were having difficulty paying their medical bills. Data from the CDC is very similar, and they showed that one out of five patients, um, particularly those younger than 65, were having difficulty paying their medical bills. So what does that mean? You could say it's cancer. Yep, yeah, it's going to be expensive, and you should just pay the bills. Well, unfortunately, I think the consequences are far greater than just on patients' pocketbooks. And what we're seeing is that cost, out-of-pocket cost, is indeed impacting patient well-being. We did a study a couple of years ago where we enrolled patients from across the country who, had, who were receiving cancer treatment and who were insured. Majority of these patients um, were actually applying for financial assistance. So really what we had was a cohort that was saturated for underinsured patients. Um, and we were able to really get a window into the experiences of these underinsured cancer patients. Of our patients, about half were spending their savings to help pay for their cancer care. Now, the median age on this study was 64. So really, they were spending their retirement savings. 46% reported cutting back on food and clothing to help pay for their cancer care. 17% reported selling property. About two-thirds reported that they had cut back on vacation or uh, leisure activities uh, because of the cost of their cancer treatment. You know, I think a, a lot of people would say, well, when you're, when you're receiving treatment for cancer, um, that's one of the first things to go. But I wouldn't discount the impact of this on patients' lives. Um, one woman on study that we talked to uh, said that her vacation was the only time after her kids left home where her family could get together, and now because of the cost of her cancer treatment, that was gone. And of course, you know, we've, we're all very familiar with Scott Ramsey's data, um, his eye-opening study uh, showing uh, association between cancer diagnosis and risk of bankruptcy. There's something about a cancer diagnosis. There's something about receiving cancer treatment um, that is, that is uh, jeopardizing the well-being uh, of our patients. But what about their care? Is it impacting the quality of the care that patients receive? And there are more and more studies um, that suggest, yes, indeed it is. And a lot of it obviously has to do with adherence. So this recent study uh, looked again at imatinib and adherence over time. The median out-of-pocket cost per month was about $30. Yet um, patients with a higher copayment had a 42% higher likelihood of non-adherence over time. Similar study looked at aromatase inhibitors in breast cancer. And again, we're talking about a level of around $30 a month and higher or lower than $30 a month. I'm not talking thousands of dollars or even hundreds of dollars. And I think these data really reflect how sensitive our patients really are um, to, their, to their monthly out-of-pocket costs. So we're seeing a growing list of financial toxicities. Uh, due to out-of-pocket costs. And if you look at just the items on these lists related to quality of cancer care, if you look at adherence and missed appointments and not filling prescriptions and delayed tests, all of these evidence-based, you have to wonder, does it impact survival? Does financial toxicity impact cancer-related outcomes? Of course, we don't know. Um, that question has not been answered yet, and I think it would be a very difficult one to answer, but it's thought-provoking. So what can we do? What can we do to ensure that patients like Chris don't have to go through really what I put him through? There's a lot of movement on this front. Um, I think the first step is in transparency. Um, and companies like Cast Light have started to cast some light on the cost um, of treatment. So this is a screenshot from their website. And as you can see here, um, they detail the cost of certain interventions. Um, for example, if a patient has an earache uh, and they went to the ER on a weekend, they'd have to pay about $708 out of pocket. If they waited until Monday, this website says that they'd only have to pay $117 to go to their doctor's office. So there are more um, apps and, and services like these uh, that are becoming more popular, and, and um, payers have cost calculators on their website. Not all patients have access to these, and, and even if they do, patients aren't aware that, that they can use them. In the next um, year or so, we're facing a patent cliff, 
where uh, drugs that came on the market about 10 years ago are now going uh, generic, are going off patent, and generics are coming on the market. We're also seeing um, the development of and the introduction of biosimilars. So will practice patterns change? Honestly, I'm not sure. The um, price for generic capecitabine approximates, at least right now, that of uh, on-brand Zolota. And as biosimilars are just sort of ramping up here, I'm not sure that their price will be very different compared to the original drug either. I'm, I'm sure there are others in the audience who can comment to this in much greater detail than I. Education plays a role. So colleagues at the University of Chicago and UCSF have developed these very low-tech but effective uh, laminated cards. And they've tested these with medical students to screen uh, for financial toxicity. On the reverse side of the card, um, are actual cost-saving strategies. Now, if you look at this list, unfortunately, most of them don't really apply to my patients, um, but it's a start, um, it's, it, and it's definitely a, a, um, a making progress in the right direction. But I think communication is also important. In a second study we did, we asked uh, patients with cancer, do they want to talk to their oncologist about their out-of-pocket costs? We found um, that about half of patients on this study said they expressed some desire to talk about costs. However, only 19% had actually had a cost discussion. So we're seeing this disconnect uh, between a desire to talk about costs and actually having that cost discussion. But we looked at this subset. So again, it's a very small sample, but intriguing, of patients who'd had a cost discussion. And we asked them, did talking to your doctor actually decrease your out-of-pocket expenses. So I'm curious, what proportion of patients do you think said talking to their doctor decreased their costs? Jeff, you're not allowed to answer. You're on the study. I hear 10%. 20%? So it's a small sample but over half said their doctors had actually decreased their costs. So I'm not, not saying it helped them feel better, improve their quality of life. I'm saying actually decreased their out-of-pocket expenses. So when I present these data to rooms full of oncologists, I, you know, the first question I inevitably get is, there is no transparency. I don't know how much these drugs cost. I don't know where patients are in their insurance plans. How am I supposed to help them? Well, here's the data. And I tell them, you're already doing it. You're already helping patients. And 75% of the time, you're helping patients with their out-of-pocket costs without changing care. And this is really important in cancer, where most of the time, we don't really have a lot of alternatives. But it can be done. It can be done uh, without knowing a lot of details um, uh, of drug cost or insurance plans. And take you back to my patient, Chris. If really, if I had just asked him that one question, do you have prescription drug coverage, without getting into all the gory details, I could have saved him thousands of dollars. What we're working on next is um, a, a, a web-based interactive app um, to intervene on financial toxicity. So what we're working on is uh, this two-part app. Uh, the first part um, will point patients to financial resources that are specific to their needs. Um, and the second part will encourage patients uh, to talk to their doctors about their financial burden and financial toxicity. I think it's important for patients and doctors to be on the same page. And hopefully this will help um, promote that discussion. So I... Um, there was a recent news article about um, Chris and um, how he sort of struggled through his cost of care. Um, I, I did something that I would recommend that none of you should ever do. And I read, that is, I read the comments to the news article. And much of the comments um, said fairly the same things, which is, you know, the, how dare this doctor prescribe this drug? How dare this doctor not talk to the patient. I tend to agree. Um, it, I think this was my fault, um, and I could, have, I could have prevented his financial toxicity. I think we need to do that more. More and more, we're seeing the parallels between the physical toxicity of care and the financial toxicity. I think this problem has been well described. Now the time has come uh, to treat financial toxicity. Thank you.
introduction so far. Our next speaker will be Peyton Howe, who will address the issue of drug shortages.